great. Okay, let's go ahead. Okay, perfect. So welcome to the last lectures of uh, Nigel's uh, Cooper. Uh, it's um, it's it's, it's so nice the, that it has been a fantastic week. So this week, is, this his lectures is the last lecture of this week, and well, uh, he will continue talking about um, well. Uh, well, maybe I would let Nigel to tell you what, what is lecture three, but it's a great pleasure to have you here, Nigel. Thank Thanks. you. Great. Thanks a lot. So, um, so indeed, I'm, uh, I'll um, continue to talk about uh, topology uh, in cold gases and uh, hopefully getting on to some aspects of dynamics, but um, or dynamical topology. So, but just to, um, uh, to, to recap, in the last lecture, uh, I was I, I talked about the churn number and how you, uh, the churn number in two dimensions is a topological invariant of the two dimensional um, energy band uh, computed as the integral of the Berry curvature over the Breuer zone, and um, uh, we talked through that in, in quite some detail, showing how you can understand it as a a, a wrapping of the sphere for two level for two level models where you can represent the local block state on a block sphere. And we can uh, understand the churn number in that um, in that sense of uh, wrapping this uh, this unit vector. Uh, and I also talked um, it, 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 to some extent about the ways in which this can be realized or has been realized in cold gases. Uh, mentioning the Harper model, I talked uh, about the Holden model and explained the low energy theory of that around the two Dirac points uh, when the gaps are opened. Uh, and I also I, I finished by talking about something which is a bit of an aside, uh, this uh, idea of generating optical flux lattices from dressing of internal states of the atom, uh, coupling to spin states, for example, of an atom. And then I explained that the, um, the Berry curvature in real space uh, can be helpfully thought of as arising from some reciprocal space type binding lattice imprinted by the lasers. So in fact, um, there, it turns out that this real space Berry curvature and magnetic flux can be interpreted uh, as the churn band of a Holden model in, uh, in reciprocal space. So uh, today, um, in the last lecture, uh, I want to uh, go on to talk about some of the physical consequences of the churn number and how, it's, it, how it's measured in, in cold gases. Um, and then I'll say uh, some words about symmetry protected topological insulators and superconductors and uh, physics beyond that with interactions and some aspects of far from equilibrium dynamics. But all of these topics are going to be somewhat compressed from my original plan because uh, we've had such good discussions and I'm, you know, I'm still happy to take more questions. So we'll see, um, we'll see uh, how much of this I get through. And the last part on far, uh, far from equilibrium dynamics will be, uh, I'll tailor to, to how much time is left and, and quite uh, what we've covered uh, so far. But before I uh, make a start on all of this, I, I want to answer one question uh, which I give um, a, a rather imprecise answer to uh, last time, but one that uh, I think is important that I, I, I don't want to um, I don't want to overlook, uh, which concerns the how one goes from a lattice model uh, to the continuum in this um, Sushri for Heger model. So I've um, on on this slide I've just I've written down uh, well I've drawn the the uh, SSH model, this set of um, sites A B sites coupled by uh, J prime and J or alt alternate, uh, alternating in space. And the, um, the time independent Schrodinger equation uh, for the amplitudes in the A and the B sites in the unit cells labeled by little j is what's shown here. Now, uh, whenever I was thinking about domain walls before and going from topological to non topological, uh, we um, went from having this periodic situation. So, this periodic case was the case where we got some Hamiltonian which depended on wave vector because the, um, the states were block waves characterized by a wave vector Q. But uh, if we go beyond that to say things are spatially varying, then we could, for example, make these couplings J prime depend on position J. And effectively, that's what we wanted to do in, in order to uh, introduce some, uh, some, ed uh, some edge. And um, in particular, uh, I defined some quantity, which was some M, which here we can make mj one over um, j prime over j, which from j prime depends on position, 
uh, and this was uh, close to the edge of the system, this uh, is goes to zero, uh, and that's where we have a gap closing. Uh, gap closing at um, QA equals pi. So the um, so what we need to solve is actually for the, the properties close to this gap closing point. And there, essentially, we make a continuum approximation. That's what we're doing in this continuum theory. If this if J prime is changing smoothly in space. And uh, what we do is we write psi J of A um, is equal to minus one to the J. That's alternating in, in unit cell because we're close to uh, QA is pi. Uh, but then we multiply it by some uh, continuous function, some smooth function, which I'll call psi tilde of A at, at position at some um, coordinate x, which is now viewed as a continuous variable, but um, we evaluate it on, these, on the lattice sites. And similarly, we have phi j b is minus one to the j phi tilde b of x equals j a. And these are, uh, these are uh, smooth continuous functions. And here I'm in smooth on the scale of, of the lattice constant. And then, so what one does is one puts this in and essentially you can, uh, you expand, to, uh, in, in compared J and J plus one, you can expand these functions in terms of their gradients. And if you do that, you get a set of equations phi tilde A of X is minus J prime. Well, it's not dependent on X, um, phi tilde B of X. And then we get plus J, there's a plus because of this, this minus one being alternating. Uh, and then it's psi tilde B minus A dx psi tilde B. So this, this is our continuum approximation to the position J minus one. So just uh, by uh, expansion around the point uh, J. And similarly, psi tilde B is minus J prime of X psi tilde A of X plus J um, times psi tilde A plus A dx psi tilde B. And uh, then putting this all together, we can, and dividing by J, I can write this as a matrix equation for these uh, a differential, it's a differential equation now. Uh, it, wasn't, it was a difference equation before, now it's a differential equation with this differential operator, the derivative, uh, and it's a, an off-diagonal matrix where we have m of x minus a dx, and m of x um, uh, plus a dx zero, psi tilde a, psi tilde b. Um, and so this, you see, you get it, it, the uh, Hamiltonian, um, the, the Hamiltonian now in this um, uh, continuum limit is approximately m of x times sigma x uh, minus i a sigma y d by dx, which was the uh, which was the Hamiltonian that we derived before by replacing q by uh, uh, minus i times the, the d by dx. Effectively, um, what that was doing was uh, uh, quickly. Uh, making this derivation where we're, we're taking the continuum limit of this lattice problem. And that's what we then use to, um, to put into the Jackie Rebbe model and get the zero energy solution. Okay, so, so that uh, I hope um, uh, answers a, a question from before that, that was uh, uh, unclear and shows that um, how this continuum limit can emerge from the lattice model and we get this zero energy state again in that, in that way. Okay, so let me, with that said, let me uh, go to talk about the physical consequences of churn bands. Right? So this, uh, we're now back to two dimensions and uh, churn bands. Physical consequences. And I, I'll run through a, a few of these. Uh, one of them, uh, which uh, of course um, we're all aware of and that I've highlighted throughout is that there's a gapless edge state. That is, if we take, if we take some sample, you know, some bounded sample uh, and we fill it with, um, it's, uh, there's a band 
of uh, turn number one, let's say, and that uh, turn number one bound we fill with uh, with uh, weakly interacting fermions, so it's a or non-interacting fermion, so it's a um, it's a band insulator. So uh, in the middle, this is a, a turn number one insulator. Well, on the edge, um, there is a gapless state, and that's uh, it, that gapless uh, edge mode corresponds to a, a one-dimensional uh, mode uh, which runs around the edge in in a single direction in, in chiral edge mode. Um, carry, uh, at the interface between the uh, turn C equals one turn band and, and the vacuum. And uh, this, um, you, can, uh, uh, you can actually derive uh, rather nicely uh, in the Holdian model using the low energy continuum theory. So let me just um, uh, uh, do that just to, to give you a, a, one way to see how this uh, emerges uh, from a, uh, a direct um, a calculation. So here I remind you, uh, I just show a slide that I showed um, in the last lecture of the Holdian model and the, the Brewin zone um, uh, in reciprocal space, where there are these two points, Q plus and Q minus, which um, in the, uh, when, which if we have just the, um, the nearest neighbor hopping on the honeycomb lattice, those are the direct points. But when we introduce this further neighbor hopping um, that Holden uh, proposed, uh, one opens up gaps, and these are uh, points at which the um, uh, the, uh, the gaps are opened in such a way that you get a net uh, a net turn number, a net uh, winding of the uh, block uh, vector over the over the sphere. And I um, uh, um, I stated what the uh, low energy effective theory was, uh, expanding around these points. Now, um, can I can I ask a question? Of course, please. Um, yeah, so in this picture, it looks like though that we've shown that like we have a net winding of, it looks like the two windings are gonna cancel out if at Q minus we have like uh, go in one direction and Q plus is oriented in the other direction. Okay, um, um, yes, so so here, um, yes, so there are, one does have to be careful. There, there are two things that are, there are two things that differ between Q plus and Q minus. One is um, one is that if you think about the the, the winding in the um, in the x y plane of this block vector, then in this case, as we go um, in an anticlockwise direction around here, then that that angle, you know, the azimuthal angle or, um, of this uh, of this vector is in this case it's well, decreasing, uh, so it's also turning anticlockwise. Whereas in this case, it, it, it's turning clockwise. So those two things together are of opposite sign. However, there's another difference, which is that at the center, so this is something that winds over to here, the block um, spin, the, the block vector is pointing in the um, minus Z direction. So it's pointing down. So this corresponds to something which winds over the bottom of the sphere. Whereas this one is something that winds over the top of the sphere. And so there are these, these two differences, essentially are two minus signs that mean that uh, in fact, these give the same Berry curvature or this Berry, cur Berry curvature of the same sign. And so they add. Now, if you, um, if you were to, uh, for example, change the, um, the, uh, the value of HZ plus that's acting, um, that's acting here such that this, uh, instead of pointing down, it wants to point up. Of course, you know, to, to change between that, you go through a point in which HZ is zero, and there's a, there's a band touching point, a direct point forms. Then if you were to go from it pointing down to pointing up, then so this plus became a point like in the Q minus, then they would exactly cancel. You get a churn, there'd be a, a topologically trivial churn number of zero band. And that's actually a very helpful way to think about how you could make an um, edge, an, an edge between the topologically trivial and topologically non-trivial cases, just by imagining that you tune the um, you tune the, um, the the band structure in such a way that if z at in, at q plus changes sign, and if if z at either q plus or q minus changes sign, there will be a gap closing point and a transition from turn number zero to turn number one band. So in, indeed, that, that's why we can, we, uh, with that picture in mind, we can, um, we can actually 
uh, derive the edge state in a continuum theory for the Holdian model. Uh, Nigel, can you just say for a second before you move on to this? Yeah, please. Uh, what in the lattice model that you drew for Haldane uh, controls the sign of HZ? Like what, I don't know, maybe you don't want to get into that because you never really wrote down in detail the lattice model. Yeah, so, just kind of, yeah go ahead. Yeah, so, so there are, um, so, this, so the lattice model, so I, so I drew, I, I showed you a lattice model that had nearest neighbor tunnelings J, and then second nearest neighbor tunnelings with phases on them, J prime. And that, that second neighbor, nearest neighbor tunnelling was the thing that Holden put in to show that it would, it would give you opposite it z on plus and minus so you get a topological band but there's a there's another way in which you can put it in it z which is very trivial which is just an energy offset between the a and the b sites so if you you know th there are two sites in the uh, unit cell you know a and b in the honeycomb in the honeycomb lattice and if you if you uh, start from a, um, a topological band, which is per, you know, has perhaps you know, been generated uh, in Holden's uh, method by having a second nearest neighbor tunneling that breaks time reversal symmetry. So you've got some topological band which, which has the, um, uh, the wrappings of the type shown here, then you can always kill that, or you can always make it topologically trivial by putting in an energy difference between, putting on an on-site energy difference between A and B. And that, uh, that will, you know, it'll add that adds something which is independent of momentum it's because it's a, it's a sigma z term that's just uniform and so whichever one of these is negative you know, will will then turn positive at some point i see so you're, you're basically adding onto this plus some delta sigma z i see and then, and then you know if delta you know if delta is positive it makes one of them turn zero uh, chain sign and delta is negative makes the other so it will always push you into, into a topologically trivial band and that's the two transitions i guess yeah i said that thanks yeah thank you so um yeah so that that's one useful way to think about it so i so i i want to um just say how, how you know how, how we would or just sketch how you would uh, uh, do the drive the edge state in this continuum theory. So we have a continuum theory with it. Hold in. Um, and uh, I'm going to do it near Q, this point Q plus, imagining that we're going to have a, a, a topological transition because the gap closes at this Q plus Dirac point. So it's Q minus, so we just get some minus signs around. And uh, using, um, well, you know, I have well, what I just had here. Let me just, let me just take this thing. So I'm just, I'm just taking what I had before, and now I, but I'm just gonna focus on the, on, on, the, on the Q plus point. So there is something like this, okay. Um, and um, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, imagine that this this H C plus now becomes a, a function of position X, which, for example, we might have a position dependent A B offset. This capital delta could depend on position or something. But let's imagine it can be done. Um, uh, then uh, we have something where again, what I want to do is to make a um, uh, continuum theory, and the continuum theory. Uh, we can uh, quickly get by uh, replacing this uh, Q tilde X by um, uh, minus uh, I A uh, D by D X. And that's, uh, th that's the kind of um, the, the quick way to, to do this sort of expansion that I, I, I explained at the start of this lecture. And so uh, what you have is then a, a differential equation uh, for the um, uh, edge states in a, in a situation where we're imagining here, let's say we could, we could imagine that we're, we've got, everything's only depending in position X. So we've got some position X and in the, in the Y direction, everything is uniform. And let's imagine that we change H Z plus such that on the left, it's uh, non-topological. Okay, so that would be, and that's if Z uh, plus uh, is less than zero. And on the right, uh, it's topological. Oops, plus greater than zero. So I'm, so I'm putting in 
some profile of Fc plus of x. But just like what I did uh, for the SSH model, but there for some m of x, so there's some z of x here. Now there's, um, uh, we still have translational invariance along the y direction. So qy tilde is still conserved. And so you're going to get states where you're going to get a, whatever states you get will be characterized by uh, qy. And it's a, um, it's a useful but, uh, exercise uh, to go through uh, seeing how you can use the result, the Jackie Rebbe result that gave you the zero mode in the SSH model and show that that will give you a band of states which describe an edge state uh, in this case. So I, I'll, I just state the, um, um, you know, the, the result, but leave it you know, as an exercise, uh, if you're interested to, to work through, uh, to show that uh, you'll get an edge state, E sub edge, uh, which you know, whose energy depends on QY tilde, the, the momentum away from this, uh, this um, uh, Q plus uh, point in the Y direction, um, uh, which and the, that energy is h bar v um, um, q y. So what that so it depends on q y tilde. So so what that um, looks like if I plot the q y tilde, there's I plot energy as a function of q y tilde. There's a yeah, in the the bulk of the system, there's a there's a band gap. You know, there's, there's some band gaps set by the um, you know, the, the size of its z uh, far from uh, far from the interface, uh, and and up here you know, there's some there's some continuum of states of this two D system uh, in the upper band and in the lower bands, but uh, this um, this edge state that comes in here uh, is something that that connects them. And there's one such edge state that's running, um, in this case, with a, a positive velocity. I may have got my signs wrong, but there's, there's just one of these. There isn't the fact we're going on. And so you recover this. This is the chiral edge state because there's, uh, on this left-hand edge, there's a single uh, edge state moving in one direction. This is a, uh, Nigel, can you remind us if an SSH model, the one-dimensional chain, the M of X was also coupling to sigma Z. Uh, it, the, the sigmas have been have been um, the sigma X Y and Z have been permuted, so it it, it didn't. Right, but it, it was a different sigma than the one coupling to Q X. Yeah, so it 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 coupled. We can go back to it. It it coupled uh, to M X coupled to sigma X, um, and. Uh, Sigma y. Oh, the other ones. Yeah, I see. Right, so okay, good, good. Uh -huh. So, so we, so we've, you know, we, we've, you know, we've, we've shifted around which poly metrics, metrics is which one, but but the structure is the same. Yeah, it doesn't and matter. Eventually, you can use the same. Uh, yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter. I just want to make sure it's not. It was, you know, once you fix q y to be zero, it's this identical model essentially. Yeah, that's right. Right. So it's so, but the but the beautiful thing is that it just it comes out naturally that your this SSH or this Jackie Rebbe uh, solution extends directly to the um, the full um, the, to the 2D churn problem uh, and and you, you recover this chiral edge state um, uh, as the as the consequence of uh, of the existence of this um, uh, this this gap direct point closing and reopening. So they're they're, they're both they're, they're very closely connected. Okay, um, so that's that. So that was yeah, one ask. central physical consequence: is the existence of this chiral, this quantum single-channel quantum mode that's running that's running around the edge. If you if you've got a churn band, whatever you do at the edge, there has to be one of these modes running around, and it can't be backscattered because there's no uh, there's no mode going the other way in which it um, uh, it uh, it could be scattered to. And that, uh, in, in one approach, can be uh, used to understand the quantization of the uh, the whole conductance in the integer quantum whole effect. I think there was a question. Uh, yeah. So oh. if I remember correctly, like you mentioned that time reversal symmetry does not 
have to be broken to have the churn numbers or does uh no, no so so I, what i said is um time reversal so time reversal symmetry um doesn't have to be present or broken it's ir irrespective of any symmetry there is such a um there is a there is a topological characterization of a 2d band but but what it, but the 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 extra feature is that if you want that topological invariant to be non-zero, that is, if you want the churn number not to be zero, then you do have to break time reversal symmetry. If you do have time reversal symmetry, you're forced to be in the in the C in the churn number zero. And so, and that, of course, I, I think maybe that's where your, your question or comments coming from. That that's um, that, that's entirely consistent with the notion of this chiral edge state. It clearly right. breaks time reversal symmetry because it's going clockwise and not anti-clockwise. That was that was exactly what I was going. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so um, okay, so the, the next uh, consequence I want to talk about is the anomalous velocity. And this refers to uh, semi-classical dynamics. Now this actually this is relevant not just uh, um, for churn bands it's relevant for any two-dimensional band structure where there's a, a, a non-zero Berry curvature somewhere in the Brillouin zone uh, so because what we're thinking about is just a, a wave packet in 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 real space and so we've got real space R and imagine there's some there's some wave packet centered at some position capital R but it has some you know, it's got some some central um, wave number of, of if it's uh, oscillation, which and that wave number I'll call capital Q. So if I if I think in 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 reciprocal space, there are some energy bands. You know, they're, they're two dimensional ones, but I just draw one dimension, and there's some uh, energy band E of Q. And so there's going to be again there's some wave packet centered on some position Q, uh, but with some you know some width and some oscillation that's related to the uh, position R. So the um, so this um, uh, semi-classical dynamics, we're we're used to the um, idea that it has it takes a very um, intuitive form that the velocity is given by the uh, group velocity q. Uh, and uh, that the if we apply a force, um, the rate of change of the momentum is given by whatever the external force is. I call it E external as the external force. But um, it turns out this is incomplete uh, when you have uh, bands with non-zero Berry curvature because there's actually an additional term here referred to as the anomalous velocity, which is given by the Berry curvature, uh, cross product of the Berry curvature and the, the rate of change of the momentum, so which, uh, you can also you can also uh, write as the as the external whatever external force is being applied. But here we have the Berry curvature. And uh, well, I, this this one can this was um, there's a there's a nice review um, uh, that's uh, by uh, Chow, Chang, and Yu. Fizz 2010, uh, where you can uh, see how to derive this and, and how to understand it. Um, I, I don't want to go through the derivation, or so, but I just want to you know, make a couple of comments that may help in terms of intuition. Uh, one is to, to notice that this, uh, this term is really like a, a Lorentz force, but acting in reciprocal space. So it's because, you know, if we had for the for normal force, you know, for the normal force, the rate of change of momentum is whatever the external force is. If we also had some additional external magnetic field, we would add a Lorentz force to this, which has got the form R dot cross whatever external magnetic field we put in. So this is this would be our you know, some sort of Lorentz force, and you can see that this um, this uh, anomalous velocity term uh, precisely uh, balances that um, uh, Lorentz type condition because it's a, a cross product of the rate of change of Q of the other form with, with some quantity, which is um, the very curvature. <laughs> so that's um, sort of, you know, one you know, useful th uh, thing to keep in mind. The, the other you know, uh, point I want to make is that to, if you want to understand where 
what it represents. And the thing, the thing to note is that uh, the only way in which you can have a non-zero barrier curvature is if you have a, a unit cell that has some internal structure, because we need to have at least two bands, we need to have at least two sites in the unit cell. So there's um, the, when we say what the wave packet is, you know, the wave packet tells us about where the, cent you know, the, the center of mass of the particle is, particle is in terms of it's where the, which unit cells it spread over, because the wave packet is um, some superposition of states over these unit cells. But actually within the unit cells, the, the uh, particle density can shift between different sites in the unit cell. The, if you like the polarization in the unit cell can change and that polarization can be different in different um, lock states. And essentially uh, what uh, this uh, anomalous velocity comes from is, is that um, in situations where as you change the, um, the, the wave vector through the external force, if, you're, uh, if this causes the distribution of particle density within the unit cell to change, uh, then that change in the distribution within the unit cell corresponds also to a current, like an a displacement um, of the, not just the center of mass of the wave packet, but of the, of the polarization. And that's, uh, um, that gives rise to the anomalous velocity. So this is really um, just reflecting how the charges we're distributing in the unit cell as, your, um, as the uh, block states are changing. And it makes it clear that you need to have block states that somehow um, uh, somehow vary as you change the um, uh, wave vector, otherwise nothing is going to happen. And particularly if I just have one site per unit cell, there's no such possibility to have any currents associated with distribu redistribution of charges of particles within, within the cell. Okay. Are there any questions on that or anything so far? I was just going to comment that uh, there's even more symmetry in these equations. So duality in the sense of the the electric field term is a derivative of the energy with respect to q that's the not that's the ordinary velocity but then external you know the electric field in the in the momentum term in the newton's equation is also derivative of the position of moment of potential which is the energy with respect to position yeah right so they're Thank even you. more symmetric than yeah okay so um Okay, so the next point I want to make is about quantized hole response. And uh, um, for here, if we have a band insulator of fermions, and uh, we can uh, we can get that directly from this uh, anomalous velocity. So this this was a, this didn't actually say anything about the churn number by itself. Uh, it just tells you about very curvature, but uh, we can uh, build it up to calculate the, the, the total, let's say we calculate the total current for this, um, for such a system. So then we'll sum over all points in the Breland zone, uh, the velocity of the particles, we've got one particle per, um, per state, because we fill the band with the, these fermions. So there's one over h bar d eq by d q, is the uh, regular group velocity. And then we have plus um, very curvature times the uh, rate of change of momentum, which is the external force uh, divided by H bar. And this uh, we, can, we can write, well, as usual, we can turn the sum into a, an integral with the total area and uh, over two pi squared, integral d to q. Uh, and then we have um, H bar d. Q uh, plus one over V equals gamma. And of course, uh, this term, since it's a derivative, we're integrating into the entire uh, space, uh, uh, and this is a, a derivative of a, of a function that's periodic, then this just gives zero. So the integral over the full band of the velocity is zero. If there was no net uh, velocity coming from the, um, uh, the, the group velocity. Um, but uh, here, because the, this force E external, we can take outside the integral, we just get the integral of the Berry curvature, which of course uh, will give us the churn number. So we can write the, if we write the current density, defining it as the total current divided by the number of particles, 
um, sorry, divided by the area, the current unit area, then we get one over two pi squared. Uh, there's a one over h bar uh, integral dt q of omega b uh, cross b external. Um, and uh, this, uh, so this uh, gives us that j current is one over h times the uh, uh, turn number. So there's a two pi goes into the turn number, two pi h bar gives you h, and then uh, we can write it as uh, a z cross uh, e external. So we get this, this transverse current uh, to the external force uh, with a, uh, um, a whole conductance, which is uh, C over, uh, over Planck's constant. Okay, so, um, so that's um, uh, a, a, uh, you know, a, a clean way to, to see the quantized uh, response. Uh, one thing, uh, one comment I want to make, uh, because it will come up when I talk about experiments in a moment, here, uh, just, you know, we've made the assumption that there's, there's one particle per state, but actually in order to get this out, all we need really is to say that the particle density uh, in the system is uniform in momentum. So if we, we could in, put in an N of Q, and if this number in Q was independent of wave vector, we just get an N, then this will just, uh, everything will just go through and we'll just get a, a current, which is C times the uh, mean density. And so, uh, so in fact, this, is, uh, um, this was used uh, by um, uh, Monaco Adelsberger uh, in, in Daniel Bloch's group uh, to measure the, um, the churn number for a, a Harper band uh, for weakly interacting bosons, which of course uh, certainly uh, are not, do not give you a band insulator, but because in the system, the, uh, the, the density was, uh, was very closely, it was um, very uniform across momentum, uh, then they could accurately measure, by measuring this, this current for uh, external force, they could actually measure this term. Okay, and the one uh, last, um, um, consequence I want to mention, uh, but also only very briefly, is the, um, the AC uh, response. So this is uh, work from Nathan Goldman and collaborators uh, Tran et al. Science Advances in 2017. And there, uh, uh, you know, we know that we have this quantized hole conductance. If we apply force in the y direction, we get a quantized current in the x direction. Uh, but uh, what they considered was uh, not what is usually done here. So this is a, a static external magnetic external field, and we get a, a, a static continuous current. They considered a situation where they made the external field uh, time dependent and oscillate at a frequency. So we have uh, um, uh, in a circular polarized way. So we have the EX and EY uh, are oscillating uh, as cross omega t plus or minus sine omega t corresponding to left and right circular polarized um, uh, forcing. And uh, then what they consider is the absorbed power in the two cases, P plus or minus as a function of this frequency. So this is and what is the rate of, ch rate of change of the energy of the system? Because of course, this is going to heat the system up. Uh, and it uh, turns out that uh, there's a, a, a nice um, 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 exact result coming from the sum rule in response, linear response functions that lets you relate the DC, that is the zero frequency uh, hole conductance, that is sigma xy at zero frequency, which is the thing appearing here, Sigma so xy in equal zero turns out up to some coefficients two over pi times the amplitude times the area of the system times the integral over all frequencies of one over frequency p, uh, p plus times p minus the difference in the problems. So this uh, this is a uh, so then if you have a a churn band or a churn insulator where the where this should be quantized, there should be a quantized 
um, circular dichroism coming from if you can um, if you can evaluate this in the frequencies and, and do the frequency integral uh, uh, cutting it off in some in, in some physically um, sensible way. Okay, so so those are the 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 the, the, the main ideas uh, that I wanted to to, to highlight, uh, and I just uh, put up a, a list of um, some of the experiments that have been done in order to uh, to see the churn bands in, in cold gases. Uh, one very direct way in which you can see the, the churn bands is to is to do band mapping and directly construct what the block um, wave functions are at each point in the Brillouin zone. And this has been done very successfully by um, the Hamburg group uh, using in a, um, to, in a system which is uh, an, somewhat analogous to the Holdian model. So it's, it's a two site um, system and by measuring um, the band mapping and they can, they can construct um, block wave function completely and therefore compute the very curvature and they can see, you know, you can see when it's uh, um, trivial or non-trivial. Uh, studies of edge states uh, have been very successfully done in using these synthetic dimensions. There, the real uh, ad advantage of the synthetic dimension is that you have the, there's a notion of a, a hard boundary that uh, you know, if, you, if you've got the synthetic dimension is something which is running over the internal spin states and the spin states stop and then you know, they don't gradually uh, go out of um, they disappear, they just stop. And so so you can um, you have very sharp boundaries and then have clean edge states that, um, that are not polluted by other uh, low energy uh, modes that you might get if you have a soft edge. Um, the anomalous velocity is measured by uh, Tillman's group. I think he uh, explained that in his lectures. I'm sorry, I missed um, the, the most recent uh, lectures, so, so I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm sure that he will have explained it. Um, and so, so that was measured in uh, the Holdian model seeing the uh, change uh, from topological and non-topological by seeing the change in the anomalous velocity uh, close to these direct points. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, there's a very um, very nice quantitative experiment done uh, by Monica Edelsberger uh, for using weakly interacting bosons and, and um, uh, getting an accurate measurement of the churn number, which was uh, one, as, as expected for the, the, the Harper model at uh, quarter flux that she, that she was using. And then finally, this uh, notion of circular uh, dichroism has been, has been um, implemented and confirmed in the, um, in the work of, um, uh, of the Hamburg group. Well, how do you do the, uh, why don't, what, why don't the bosons uh, both condense? Are you saying? Uh, well, they, uh, if if it, if it was at zero temperature, then then you, so the in this the, the, essentially the temperature the point is that the temperature is larger than the bandwidth, but smaller than the band gap. Uh -huh. So because in these um, in the Harper model, if you're at low enough flux, you, you've got very flat bands, and it's it's extremely difficult to it'd be extremely difficult to load bosons in adiabatically and have them in the in the lowest energy state of that extremely flat band. Uh, if calculations show that if you're weakly interacting bosons, well, there are actually several minima and there can be some there can be some translational symmetry breaking, but effectively you expect weakly interacting bosons to give you a vortex lattice that's pinned, you know, condensate, which is a vortex lattice pinned to the um, to the uh, underlying lattice. Um, I see. But actually it's an insulating, so they're in, it's an insulating state, a mod insulating state. Or... Well, no, 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 that, so these are weakly interacting. Oh. So here, yeah. everything I'm saying is weakly interacting. Oh. If you, uh, so the, their experiments are in situations of you know, it's a two dimensional lattice, but the it's you know it's a three D gas, so they're, they're actually two. Uh, um, it's a lattice of tubes. Oh, these I tubes, see. Um, these tubes have got you know, fairly weak uh, interactions between the particles. So, so it's a, it's a very good approximation to, to view it just in, in the Gross-Petetsky approximation at, at if you were at sufficiently low temperature and, and it was condensed. And so what I was saying was that if we have a, um, the Gross-Petetsky solution at that flux for weakly interacting bosons is a vortex lattice uh, that's pinned to the underlying um, physical lattice of the, uh -huh. of the upper model. This was one 
is one quant one flux quantum per per four sites, a quarter flux, and so it has to arrange you know, it forms some some mm -hmm. you know, only a subset of them are of the plaquettes of the uh, vortex, and it, it makes some pin vortex lattice. So so that's that's the expected ground state, but in practice. You have to go to extremely low temperatures. To, you have to go to extremely low temperatures to see that, and that that wasn't possible in the experiments that they studied. But in fact, you know, they were able to you know, take advantage of the fact, noticing that the through band mapping, noticing that essentially the density distribution was uniform, was enough to um, then um, use it as a way to um, to measure this churn number. Mm -hmm. Nigel, one question. Um, so for the edge states, I mean, I, I clearly see the edge states for the Mancini experiments that were only two leg or three. I have problems trying to identify a chair number there where you have just three, three. I mean, is, is can you think really about a chair number in this situation? No, yes, it's just a, it's I mean, just a rabbit problem and rabbit oscillations, no? Yes, yeah, so strict, strictly no. I mean, the, the chair number, that we you know, really strictly only exist for a, you know, an infinite 2D system. You know? So that's uh, up, up to, you know, the thing is that, um, uh, you know, what does infinite mean? It's really, there's, there's, a, there's some characteristic length scale. And if you're, if the system is bigger, you know, the characteristic length scale is something like a magnetic, it's like magnetic length, or it's the it's the distant, or the the, um, the length scale, who, the square of the length scale is the contains one flux quantum. So that's rough, you know, it's a natural length scale. And if your system is larger than that length scale, then then um, then the corrections to the infinite size system are become exponentially you know, get, get small very quickly. So actually, you know, if the if the intrinsic if this correlation length is small enough, then you don't need to have a very big system in order to accurately represent the bulk. You know, it's, one one another way to say it is that the the you know to have edge states. You know, if you've got a, a narrow strip, you don't really have two. You don't have two decoupled edge states. We have a we have a mode going on the bottom and one on the top, but they, mm -hmm. they penetrate into the bulk. And they overlap to some extent, so it's it's only you know, but the, the depth of the you know how much they penetrate is this correlation length, and if you if you make the strip wide enough to be that that correlation length is small and you you don't you know and the tunnel the rate of scattering the backscattering rate from one to the other is small enough then then you could say that it's representative of the two D limit and say it has it, it's, it has some turn number. But um, but I think uh, I think that um, I, I think that it's, um, it's just strictly speaking no, but it, you know, in practice you know, it may be that it's it's the right you know, that it's appropriate to think of the narrow system as being representative of, of a large one. I, I I don't know precisely which which experiments or questions or, or points yeah well but they have just two internal levels and tunneling along one direction so everything was edge kind of mm -hmm. yeah I, I think it's it's um yeah i i i i, I also yeah, I, I i have the same the same difficulty and answer uh, that that it's it's going to come down to uh, I, mean, I, I i don't know what to say about um you know what was what claim was made? So I don't want to, you know, without reading exactly what it is. But indeed, that you know, a, a two-leg ladder sounds, you know, much more like, you know, quasi one. You know, it's more, it might seem more natural to think of it as a, a one-dimensional system, mm -hmm. one system rather than representative of a two-dimensional one. But again, it, you know, maybe it depends quite what you look at. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? Uh, if you have a 3D system, um, I guess in this 2D system, I can imagine it's sort of easy to see that this very curvature points in the Z direction. But in a 3D system, yeah, I don't get where it should point in. Do, do these results hold? So, yeah, so, so in a 3D system, the, the very curvature becomes a vector. So it's a vector field. So, um, uh, and you and uh, analogous so well the the quantization of the of the whole conductance and so on that that won't 
um, apply because we don't have a we don't have a topological invariant. Um, so the, the topological invariant was the flux of this of, of a basically the flux of this very curvature through a two D surface. And it, so if we integrate over a three dimensional Brillouin zone, we, we we can't get that. We don't have the topological invariant. But other things do apply, like the the anomalous velocity will still be there, and um, so that uh, we could um, consider. And then the very um, yeah, the, the very curvature is a vector, and so there's a, there's some vector in 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 your band structure that that you should uh, uh, take account of, and that tells you about you know of course if you apply force then you know, the particles can move in three dimensions, and there can be an anomalous current in any one of the three dimensions, and, and so 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 that 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 will uh, certainly is still is still valid and and, um, and relevant. The um, 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 there are there are some I mean there are some interesting features of thinking about Berry curvature in three dimensions which I, I won't have time to cover here but uh, if you, there are um, uh, semi metals or vile semi metals where there are if you have a situation where there's a a, a point which is like a, a monopole of Berry curvature then we know that because that um, you know, that's that that very curvature uh, cannot um, uh, over uh, it's quantized or it's it's topologically invariant over a surface enclosing that point, then it, it can't disappear. You know that very curvature is, is a flux that that's that's um, uh, that's conserved. And so as we shrink a sphere around this, then we have to get something singular. And the only way to resolve that is to have a band closing point. And so there, there's a stable. A topologically stable band closing point, which is a, 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 a vial point. And so, so the notion of very curvature in, in higher dimensions is also very useful, but it's, it, 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 doesn't, uh, it doesn't give you uh, the, the quantized whole conductance. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Just to think a little bit more on that last question. Uh, so I guess in general, you know, imagine I wanted to think about other dimensions like four dimension or something, the Berry curvature would actually, maybe I can just say it's always a two form and a, a two form in 2D like, is dual to a scalar and 3D it's dual to a vector, something like this. Is That's that right. the right way to think about this? That's right. yeah. so, so really, I, you know, I should have said that whenever I defined the Berry curvature, uh, you know, there was a, there was a, there was a Berry um, connection, the U, D, I, or, or D, I think D, X, I, I was using coordinates X. And so I put the, you know, that could be in any dimension once and we take the ith component of that um, uh, of U. And so we have some, you know, some D-dimensional vector if in a D-dimensional space. Uh, and the, um, the very uh, curvature is a, a two form that I can think as a derivative D, or D, X, I of A, J minus D, X, J of A, I. So, so I should I should construct this uh, this object. Um, um, yeah. um, I also have. We, we okay. Just uh, uh, yeah. with epsilon, right? You, you know the scale that you talked about. You just contracted with epsilon. That's right. In two D, you contract with epsilon becomes a scalar. In three D, it's epsilon i j k becomes a vector. But it's um, but yeah. it's a we should just take it as this as this uh, two point. Uh, so I have a question. So um, for the quantized Hall response part, so you mentioned the density. And I wonder if a similar, it's a similar picture if the density is fractional or it's completely different thing. Uh, it's, it's a very good question. So so for the fractional quantum Hall effect, which is I guess what you're, uh, yeah. you're getting. So, so there um, we um, cannot directly Relate the um, uh, the response function to this um, to the populations of these single particle states. So that's okay. um, it's a point that actually has been discussed in literature, and I think there's a paper by Steve Simon and uh, uh, Nick Reed where where they clarify this issue. So it's it's um, but but for the fractional system, quantum hole system, the, the subtlety there or the, the issue is that. Really, once we have interactions, there are internal forces between the particles, and we can't we, we can't just expand 
the many particle wave function in terms of plane waves and say that we're mm -hmm. going to apply an internal force, all I need to think about is you know, how that force pushes on one particle. Actually, you apply a force and every part of the particles are all pushing on each other and, and they, they respond in a collective way. And so, so that, that formula is not um, uh, for, for strong, for strong, very strongly interacting systems like the fraction of Hall effect, that's not, um, uh, that cannot directly be applied. So, so, so this, okay. this was really uh, uh, assuming, well, essentially I was assuming non-interacting particles to, to motivate that formula. Okay, so, so, so for uh, for the integer high effect, it's kind of we can actually still use like the say a formula grid theory or something. But for fractional, we need another ground state, basically. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Nigel. I had a, I had a couple of questions, if I may. Okay. Uh, so one is, you know, like in in the quantum hall context, uh, you know, flux binds charge so there's a you know if you have non-uniform flux if you added extra flux then you get some extra charge and also like in other systems like um uh, you know when you have skirmians uh, associated with a skirmian in real space you have some it carries some charge so i'm i'm, at, I'm wondering whether there's any charge in homogeneity associated with uh uh well, okay, so what I'm thinking is you have Berry curvature in momentum space, mm -hmm. but it's if it's not homogeneous in momentum space, let's say it was localized at one at some Q, then that would correspond to some charge. Well, it would correspond to in real space some modulation. Does does it correspond to any charge? Can you create does it correspond to any charge? In homogeneity or periodicity or some structure in the charge in the real space charge distribution well i, I, mean, I think you have to you have to think what what, you know, what particles are we going to put into this band if we if it's a i mean most of what i've been um, thinking about or, or or most of you know how this is discussed is is where we have not you know, a band insulator we just populate the band with oh i frame. see and so so actually you know the um the, the charge distribution it could have some because it could have some features on the on the lattice constant the scale of the lattice constant but it has no um it has no particular um because it's incompressible you say yeah yeah and it's so 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 there I, I, um, yeah, so, so, so there I, I don't see any scope for it. Um, I mean, there, there may be, like, if, we, yeah, if, if we start thinking about bosons and asking how they, how they interact and what, you know, whether the, you know, what the band structure is, um, then well, I need to. Are you saying if I add like, well, so in some sense, quantum hall is also, charges you know the state is gapped in the bulk you could say so then you know one could but there we know we insert like you know if we insert a unit of flux then we get a unit of charge or some fraction of charge in the fractional case mm -hmm. so i'm wondering if i create well okay it's hard to think because it's this uh, berry curvature is you have a constant, but it's in, in momentum space. So I don't really know how to, but if I if I create some non-trivial, uh, you know, if I, well. I, you want to insert the flux in momentum space, right? So it's like twisting the boundary. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know how to think of it in real space, what's going to happen in real space, but it seems like, you know, here in the simple, simplest model, uh, omega is constant in, real, in, moment, in momentum space. But if it was had some structure, you know, on some scale that has nothing to do with lattice scale, I can imagine maybe there's some interesting charge yeah. induced but, in real space. Or? It, but, but hold, but I mean, omega, the, the Berry curvature is not typically not um, uh, not homogeneous. I mean, in, 
uh, you know, in the Dirac in the hold-in model, it's it's strongly concentrated around the two Dirac points. So it's it's very curvature oh. longer than zero, and it's only you know, two points you know um, that become you know, Dirac points close. It's really a you know singular point, but but there's a there's a right right they are concentrated around Dirac so, points. So it's actually it can be very homogeneous, and in fact you can show that it's for a two-bound model it has to vanish it. Uh, Twice, wow. two, two times the term number, or something. Or some, uh, so there's a, um, uh, so it's it's not always uh, homogeneous. In, for lambda levels and the continuum lambda level, it is exactly homogeneous. But but in these lattice models, it can be yeah, better. yeah, I guess that's true. And yeah, and so there's no, there's nothing that's happening in real space in terms of charge I distribution. Think, yeah, there's a bit of, yeah, I, I can't think of. I mean, the, the, it's also, I'm not sure. Um, it's not, if we've got a, it may be that we have to we have to break the periodicity and make a much bigger um, uh, uh, yeah. I, I, if I think about maintaining the size of the of the unit cell, mm -hmm. then I can't I can't um, it's, you know then putting in a changing the well, I guess you want to just change the distribution of the very curvature. Yeah. So you're changing the distribution. I, I, I'm not. I'm not sure what, what um, whether that has consequences directly. I mean, of course, it's you know changing the distribution also changes the nature of the orbitals and the nature of the interactions. I too. So there are many things that are coupled. So I I, I don't yeah. know of a, a direct um, connection. The, in the, the real space case, I know you're, you're describing about skirmions and so on. There, it's it's really connected to the fact. Essentially connected to the fact that you've got um, you know, as you as you turn on this this extra flux, the um, the quantum Hall state uh, responds by accumulating the, uh, you know, the accumulating charge onto the flux quantum, and so you you, you, can, you can basically pump the charge in onto each flux quantum, and that's a, yeah. No, I mean I see what's happening. It's like you because you do it in momentum space, and you fill the band in momentum space. If each each state at each you know each orbital is inhomogeneous, each block state is inhomogeneous, then when you add them all up, you have a homogeneous. Uh, you know, on long scales, there's a there's just homogeneous distribution of charge. Yeah. Okay. And so the other question I had is uh, going back to your semi-classical equations. Uh, what happens with the? It seems like, well, I don't. What happens with a real magnetic field? You would think that you would add to the Hall response, but instead it's it seems to give you omega B cross omega cross physical B like term. So it, it's not clear what, it seems like it gives you some longitudinal response. Like if I feed in your equation Q dot, there'll be E external crossing mm -hmm. omega sub Barry but they're also going to be R dot cross, you know, omega sub Barry cross B cross R dot. And yeah. so, you know, there are two R dots I can bring it to the other side. And it seems like it modifies, there'll be a B external B dependent response. So I'm wondering what, what is that effect? Yes, I, I don't. I, I, it's um, it's it's not it's not a it's not something I've thought about. I, I would. Um, I, 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 I see your point. I see, I see it's there. I I, um, I don't have. Yeah, I don't have. Okay. A, that, that's your, you know name to give to it. Um, uh, or. Um, but the nothing that you remember after that you had that like that's some effect that's known discussed or. Yeah, I I I. I I, I don't. Uh, I don't recognize it off, you know, directly. It's, um, fair enough. Fair enough. Just uh, all right. But it's, yeah, it's a, it's a good point. 
Thanks. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. what, what's always confusing me is like in the pure quantum hall problem, as opposed to churn band problem, you have a physical magnetic field that breaks time reversal. Here, you know, you also break time reversal, but you know, you discuss it purely in the momentum space and in terms of the, well, not only momentum space, but in terms of Berry curvature. But it seems like, you know, they one should lead to the other and they should be somehow tied together, if you wish, like the B external may sh should produce some omega sub B. Well, um, no, but so I, I think that I, I think, um, I think one can make a, a clean distinction between the what your lattice model is, and the lattice model determines your you know, your um, your dispersion relation, your band structure, and the Berry curvature. And then you can have, given that lattice model, we're going to we're going to add external weak external forces. I see and the external forces. Um, uh, we've decided to treat that as a separate property mm -hmm. from the, uh, from what we call part of the lattice. So so that's that's why I emphasize putting this extern x on because I, I want to think of these as being separate from the um, from whatever the lattice was and the lattice determine eq and omega b. Okay. So I think I think that indeed whenever you know if you have you know, if you have uh, you think about magnetic fields in um, in the Harper model or, 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 or lambda levels, then, then one can trade off the two things, but um, and, and there should be some connection, but, but those are you know, quite, you know, it's quite a special model. I think in, in other cases, I think you know, in general, I think one can, um, one can there is a, sort of a clear distinction. That, that one Thanks, thank you. Okay, let, let, let me, um, unless, so are there any further questions or let me go on to say, um, a few more words about so I so I spent a long time think, uh, talking about um, the SSH model one dimension uh, topology and there we had a topological invariant that was symmetry protected um, and two D there was a, um, a churn number and the churn number is not symmetry protected it's there it was it was, it was a churn number uh, irrespective of uh, any symmetries in the system and I, I just without you know I have no time uh, to to say in much detail, but just to say how this fits into this, this broader class of symmetry protected topological insulators and topological superconductors, which are based on um, extending or, or these sorts of ideas uh, to uh, a set of uh, a set of symmetries, which are uh, time reversal symmetry, particle hole symmetry, and chiral symmetry. And th these are symmetries that were identified by Alpine and Zernbauer in considering essentially structureless Hermitian matrices or random matrices, but uh, so these are some generic symmetries that can um, that can appear and that uh, it's the complete set of generic symmetries of the uh, therefore non-spatial symmetries of the Hermitian matrices. And they give 10 classes with uh, names uh, appearing here on the left hand side which correspond to different ways in which these symmetries are either present, how they're realized or, or if they're uh, absent. And uh, a triumph of, uh, of recent um, uh, theoretical work um, from uh, Ludwig's group and uh, Kataev is to, um, to identify the topological classification in, uh, for these different classes of symmetry in um, uh, all different spatial dimensions. And so I, I, I put this up just to um, just to uh, point out that if we have a there's a class class A where there are no symmetries, so this means that none of the there are no symmetries at all in two dimensions. There's um, the Z uh, says that there's a set of integers that uh, that classify the topology of the system, and that's so that's the churn into churn uh, number that uh, we've been discussing in the last uh, lecture or two. But in um, uh, but if uh, if um, you have let's see in uh, in one dimension there's no churn uh, if there's no symmetry uh, you get um, zero meaning there's no topological classification in one dimension without symmetry protection uh, but uh, if you have chiral symmetry that's that's this appearing here then you get a set of integers and in fact you can um, relate that to the 
uh, to the winding number that uh, I was discussing before in the, in the SSH model. But in fact, the SSH model also has time reversal symmetry and charge conjugation. Um, and so it actually, it actually falls in this class, but uh, for that particular model, but it, it could be uh, connected to this case where we break time reversal and um, particle flow symmetry. I, I, as I said, I don't want to go through this, but but just um, want to um, point it out to let you know how I, some of what I said fits into it, and also to um, um, to say that the um, uh, the structure of, of the of what you saw in for the SSH model also similar sets of structures appear in imposing symmetries in these other classes, and in particular. Uh, the one case I wanted to uh, mention is if we have superconductors. So, so, so Nigel, uh, yeah, please. can I ask maybe just a broader question about this classification on the table that you showed? Uh, yeah. So uh, I know that I believe that this work is pretty rigorous for the case of translationally invariant Hamiltonians or periodic Hamiltonians. If I have disorder, is it still mathematically rigorous or do you kind of have to use perturbative arguments on top of that or what's so um, the level of mathematical rigor, I, 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 I don't know, but, but uh, the, 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 the way in which this was derived in, the, in this um, uh, was different and uh, you know, it's been derived in different ways. One of the ways um, from the work of Ludwig was to consider essentially disordered systems and ask what are the conditions under which the surface states are, cannot be localized. So, so they were using uh, um, theories of, uh, of uh, localization and um, the RG flow of localization in the in one lower dimension on the surface state. To and if if that surface state was in, uh, was immune to disorder, then they'd say, well, it must be a topological. It's a topological class, and that's how they got their entries. And so. So then, now of course, that's a um, you know, that's um, based on arguments that we're familiar with from the theoretical physics perspective. But the step beyond that to mathematical rigor, I'm afraid, is is uh, beyond me to say uh, to what extent that's being established. But I, th I think from the you know, from the theoretical physics perspective, the um, the the Stability disorder is um, is, um, is well established and expected because it is, can even be viewed as a um, as a way to derive this. So, so I guess this is partially tied to the other questions. So, um, I guess the approach I had more in mind was looking at like uh, class uh, fundamental groups of uh, various uh, covering spaces or something of the. Uh, of the Brewan zone uh, functions on the Brewan zone anyway, so I guess. Um, to what extent is this complete, right? Is it just that these are topological invariants and there may be other topological invariants that distinguish states or is this it? You know, is this all the topological invariants you could have? Well, I think that the, so the way you should interpret it is that if you, if you give yourself the freedom to deform your Hamiltonian, but only, um, but subject to a constraint that it always has to satisfy the symmetry, then, then I think that this is this is the classification we can, you know, one can in principle. There's no subdivision beneath this. This is this is the set of top. Okay, so, so it's a stronger result than just saying the fundamental group is has this. Uh, yeah. yeah, but I thought there's. I mean, there's also other symmetries you can introduce. These are only. Yes. I'm aware of the crystalline symmetries that will give you finer uh, distinctions between. Well, it'll give you different, different. Um, yeah, it's just a, it's a, it'll give you another axis that you can you can expand, and that uh, will give you a different. But then you're you're deforming with additional constraints. So and then Fate, with, with, you once know, you're deforming with additional constraints. I'm sorry. I, I think the I didn't quite catch that. Sorry, uh, my internet cut out. So I don't know. If, yeah, I, I. I was yeah, just. I, I was just saying. There's other symmetries, like crystalline symmetries, that give you other 
other topological phases, you know, other SPTs, right? Yeah, maybe I, I just skipped to, I, I had, I, I, you know, just to put up the slide, because I, absolutely, I mean, that's, that's, um, that's the point, you know, so I, I was going to, I think, you know, in, 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 uh, in view of time, I'll, I'll just sort of um, skip over the, the, the one thing I was going to add there, but, but say that in, indeed, uh, like Leo says, that you, know, you have to um, be aware that you can, you know, we can, you can consider other symmetries and, and, and that may be very relevant in, um, uh, in um, that may be re very relevant in, for cool gases because these crystalline symmetries you know, require you know, perfectly ordered lattices. And, and that's rather, you know, can be difficult to do in solid state, of course, not always, but, but it's, it's very easy. In fact, it's natural in cool gases. So the crystalline symmetries so there, the topological insulators would be ones where you would get gapless states on certain surfaces, but other surfaces will not have gapless states because it really relies on how you cut the surface with respect to a crystal. Um, and these higher order topological phases, which are stabilized by rotational symmetries, where you don't, you might have a gapped 2D system. There are no, there's no um, gapless edge mode. So it's not topological in the sense we've been discussing so far, but uh, it could have gapless corner states. So that's the higher order of sense that it's, it's a, a sub-dimensional uh, uh, manifold in which the gapless state exists. And there are, and that's, and everything I've said here so far is just for non-interacting non fermions. But in fact, you can put on, um, there are symmetry protected interacting phases um, for, uh, which can also be of bosons. Uh, like uh, quantum spin models, uh, as realized in the Paris group and these Rydberg systems. And beyond that, there's a class of um, uh, systems that are said to have intrinsic topological order, where they're, um, is, which are characterized by having long range entanglements and having um, quasi particle excitations. You can have quasi particles in the, in the bulk of the system which are fractionalized and carry fractional particle statistics. And the, the classic example is a fractional quantum hole systems. So there's, so you know, I, you know, I had a title of topology. I just wanted to put one slide up to say that you know, what I talked through is a tiny corner of, uh, of where topology uh, arises. And it is also, you know, the word topology used in different ways to mean qualitatively different things. And you have to be clear because, you know, we talked a lot about symmetry protection, but it's only a certain class of symmetry, but you can extend that class. We haven't talked about interacting phases at all, and we haven't talked about intrinsic topological order and particle fractionalization. Um, so, but, so I, I think in, in the, um, what I wanted to do, uh, just to conclude, is to, uh, to say a few words about uh, dynamical effects. So here, in the, in the view of um, time, I really cut things short. I, I had some slides prepared, and I decided, you know, thinking I would just pick out a few slides to uh, talk about where the dynamics, uh, far from equilibrium dynamics, can come in. So here, dynamics, I don't mean adiabatic pumping. Um, I don't mean flock A, which has got a particular periodic dynamics. I mean, you do some quench experiment or you have some you drive the system far from equilibrium. And the question is, does, you know, does topology tell you anything about that? Everything so far has been about, been about ground state properties. It's you know, phases of matter, um, filled Fermi gas, or sort of, or band insulator. These are all zero temperature phases, real ground state properties. Um, but um, now I want to think about non-equilibrium dynamics. And the, 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 the motivation we had for thinking about this was that in cold gases, we, you can readily dynamically change the bands. So for example, we could have, you know, we could have some you know, topologically trivial band insulator here, you know, change the band structure. So there's a band, there's a gap closing um, and the topology changes. And of course, when it, when it changes, you, um, there are gonna be some excitations in general because it can't be adiabatic because you had to have a band closing. And we wanted to think about whether there's there are any uh, interesting features uh, here. Now, I, um, 
Uh, this is a whole story I could give, and you can even maybe find lectures online that I've given uh, talking about this. But I just I just jump to the um, jump to one picture that uh, that sort of summarizes you know how you can think about it. So it it turns out that um, there is still a topological classification when the system is out of equilibrium, and I have this picture that tries to summarize how it relates to the normal uh, equilibrium classification. So in, in the equilibrium classification, we could say that you know, two states were topologically distinct if we couldn't smoothly connect them and smoothly meant without a band closing. So imagine that you allow yourself to have the, that the ground state have a certain Hamiltonian and you allow yourself to deform the Hamiltonian in any way that preserves the symmetries that you've imposed and you ask, can I, can I deform into any other state? And the notion of topology is that, well, sometimes you can get anywhere and sometimes you can't. And when you can't, you have these sort of sectors and circles, which are the different topological sectors that you can adiabatically deform to. Now you can ask the same thing out of equilibrium and say, well, can I um, take any state psi one and deform it through unitary evolution with some Hamiltonian H to actually here it's written H times T, but really, I mean, the integral, you know, the time ordered integral of H with time. So any time evolution that you want of the Hamiltonian, again, you can ask that imposing symmetries on the Hamiltonian H, you know, um, because we could say that that's, you know, that, that's, you know, that's, that's the rules of the game. It was the rule of the game in the first thing. And um, in this case, uh, it turns out, well, that there is a top, still a classification. There are some things you can do, some things you can't do. You can do more now than you could do before. Um, so actually some of the sectors that were disjointed now you connect, but you can um, get a classification. And the, um, so this is something I, uh, I had a student, Max McGinley, uh, worked out in, in great detail in, in many different settings, but uh, he, um, in one of the, settings was uh, for these um, free fermion, these non-interacting topological insulators and superconductors. And he uh, deduced the, um, the non-equilibrium, what goes from equilibrium to non-equilibrium uh, uh, classification. And so here I pointed out these two things. One is in, in 2D with no symmetry where you have the churn number, that, uh, that classification you can, uh, is preserved out of equilibrium. There's a, a just, just, you can't adiabatically evolve one um, a system of one churn number into another one, no matter what you do with the time evolution of the Hamiltonian. Uh, but if you think about this class of the that the SSH model set in, where there there's this winding number uh, uh, z, but actually the classification becomes z2. So in fact, you can, in principle, under time evolution, while preserving uh, these symmetries, you can um, you can, if you want, find a Hamiltonian which will will evolve a, a state from one sector into a, another. That will change the, the sectors that you had before and leaving only a, a two sectors for um, uh, corresponding to um, Nigel, um, zero or one. Yep. I, I think there's a subtlety here. So if I have a time dependent Hamiltonian, do I require the symmetry at all possible times on the Hamiltonian or just on a, the net unitary evolution operator? I'm not even sure if, I, if this question makes sense. Um, no, it, 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 makes, it makes perfect sense. So, so in fact, so what we require is that the, the symmetry applies at all times. So the Hamiltonian applies as, and that the symmetry is applied in the same way. Because you can, you can also, whenever you say there's a timer, you can say a time reversal symmetry, but it can be realized by different, unit, by different anti-unitary operators. Yeah, I'm just saying that it's time reversal is not necessarily enough. It's the same time reversal, the same operator. So you, you haven't changed any symmetry at any time. You, you might think that, you know, you might think that, um, uh, that, that there's no way in which you would go out of the topological sectors because you know, certainly adiabatically, that there's no way you would do that. Uh, that's uh, uh, but but once it's out of equilibrium, you can and uh, essentially it's the time reversal 
um, these anti-unity operators is connected to the time reversal that break that or whose symmetries are lost and you get a you get a, a more connected space. So this this is um, so that's clearly a mathematically well-defined way of defining this. And it's clearly, it seems like an interesting way of defining the symmetry. Is it the only right way or could other ways also be interesting classification? Oh, others could be interesting too. You know, this, this is what we did. Yeah, this is, no, I think this is, we had it, we essentially, you know, had in mind, imagine that you have some system, you know, and it, you control, you could play with these knobs, but there was some reason why that system is had a restricted form of Hamiltonian, you know, and you know, what where can you get to from that? So, so that that was our, but but there there may well be, I mean, there's as you say, there's a lot of scope to to what rules of the game you set up, and there may be other one, other other um, that are very interesting and uh, and maybe um, useful in other circumstances. But the um, I, I just uh, say to so, uh, in the last uh, minutes. That you know the uses of this are so there are two there are two main uh, points where, where this is helpful. One is that it lets you know whether you could uh, dynamically prepare a topological phase or, um, by you know by starting in one state and which might have no topology and can you by doing something non adiabatic and you're playing with the Hamiltonian and whatever could you could you get into another state and uh, as I said for the turn number you can't but for these uh, for this SSH model, um, in principle, you, you can, and this, you know, th this once you know that you can that you can change this this invariant. You know, that actually, once it's the equilibrium, it can change, but you can you can change it by even integers. Then you can you can come up with ways in which the um, in which you, you have a quench of the Hamiltonian, which takes you from one state to another one. Like this is something where there's no winding on the block sphere, but then it wraps it twice. It's going to go from zero to two at, at this, at this last, nearly at the last point. It should wrap up twice. So that's um, and the the other um, the other aspect that we uh, thought about is that it also tells you about the stability of the the surface states if you have uh, external noise. So the noise drives the system out of equilibrium. So it's not it's not a zero temperature ground state anymore. But the noise is uh, it's performing sort of noisy random unitary evolution on the system and it's, uh, this classification tells you whether or not the um, uh, symmetry respecting noise uh, if you even if you have um, uh, uh, terms that, um, that that don't break don't explicitly break the symmetry whether they can um, uh, cause sort of broadening or decoherence of these of these uh, uh, edge modes and uh, uh, we've also followed up to think about how this uh, connects to open quantum systems, and, and there there are connections to what Sebastian Deal has talked about, but he's, that's not something I, I, I can get into here. So, um, let, let me, so since in the interest of time, I, I'll stop there. I, I just, I'll just conclude with you know, putting the overview that I, that I started with. Um, I, I got through some of it. Um, uh, I, I think I was, I was much too ambitious um, uh, because I, I think um, these these lectures have been uh, much more useful because of the, the questions that were raised, and I've really enjoyed uh, talking through uh, the questions and uh, and uh, hearing the questions. It helped clarify my thoughts and presentation in, in general. So I'm I'm happy to have uh, gone through that. I, I hope that um, you've got uh, some uh, something out of it and some intuition about these systems and the connections to cool gases. Uh, of course, um, for the topics that I didn't cover, uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, to talk in person or to discuss anytime. So just you know, let me know if there are things that you're interested in, and, and we can follow up uh, on that um, uh, separately. But um, uh, for now, I, I just conclude here. And again, thank my, um, my collaborators, uh, Jean, Ian, and Marcello, uh, uh, Joe, Gunnar, and Max, and the dynamic group. Excellent. Thank you, Nigel. It's very nice. Yeah, very Thank good. you. Very nice. Yes. We have tons of questions, and I think we should start preparing for because we have in 15 minutes we have the discussion. But if there is one, no, I think yes, I only if there is one very short question, uh, please ask the last chance. Otherwise, we just thank Nigel and we recombine in 15 minutes. Thanks.
Thank you, Nigel. Okay, very la late for you. I mean, by for Nigel, it's almost midnight. Thank you so much for doing that for us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Nigel. Bye-bye.